Good evening, my name is Lord Sir Bloom and I'll be your host for tonight. Tonight I will show you another creation of mine, and this time it's a subclass of the Warlock. To be honest, Warlock is my main class to go to in D&D, and I played enough Warlock to hopefully understand the class enough to be able to balance the subclass for it. I must admit that this subclass is heavily inspired by Bloodborne and, of course, if you notice the cover image for this video, <laughs> well, I'll give you a point if you can guess what reference is it from. And also, in Bloodborne, if you remember, Moon Presence, Beastly Corruption is the, the one that caused the werewolf problem, right? The human beast problem in Bloodborne. So, yeah, imagine that as your patron. So, in this video, I will tell you the lore and idea and the concept of the subclass, and then we will go to the expanded spell slots and the class feature. Remember, every number you see here can be adjusted to suit your game balance. Alright, without further ado, let's talk about lore. A fathomless beast entity touch your mind in your sleep, granting you insight to see the world beyond yours. In between its growls and howls and gnashing of teeth, you think you can make out a single word. Hunt. Is it just your mind trying to find meaning from nothing but a mindless beast? You never know, but you're not taking it yet. The moment you drew blood from your first hunt, your body changed to resemble that of the beastly entity plaguing your mind. Well, that being said, you can make your character into a were penguin if you want a fun, quirky adventure. So, at this point, Warlock is trying to fill every class roles in their own unique way. But there's no druid theme Warlock yet, despite having the awesome Eldritch Invocation name like the Sculptor of Flesh. So, here's a werewolf class for D&D 5e if you fucking hate druids like me. As usual, with every Warlock class, they are very front-loaded. Look at the Fathomless, they get what is basically a better spiritual weapon at level 1 without expanding a single spell slot. So yeah, the first level feature is definitely the defining factor of this class. The level 6 feature usually a win more feat that doubles down on the first feature. 10th level feat is usually a mundane but powerful buff that lets you catch up with the party's power level and 14th level feature is... Well, they go a bit wild on this one. So yeah, I followed the pattern and hopefully makes it balanced and feels like an official class option. Alright, enough about that. Let's talk about the actual class mechanics. So, as for the expanded spell list, uh, first level spell, we got Beast Bond and Animal Friendship. Second spell, second level spell, we got Look at Animals or Plants and Path Without Trace. Third level spell, we got Conjure Animals and Non-Detection. And on fourth level spell, we got Dominate Beast and Polymorph. And fifth level spell, we got Awaken and Geass. Okay, so, for the expanded spell list, I want to show their beastly nature by giving them the spells that either relates to their animalistic side or will be useful in hunting and stalking their prey. Oh, also, please do remember that you cannot cast spells without your arcane focus, but that can be fixed with a class feature that we'll talk about later. For the first level spells, it's just a nice way to bond with any beast you might come across. Look, it doesn't have to be all about killing and hunting. I mean, it can be, but I thought if you, like, make a... <laughs> make a... Okay, I'm sorry. Meet a pack of wolves in the forest and imagine talking to their alpha and having some sort of an alliance with this pack of wolves. That would be cool, isn't it? For the second level spells, it's all about hunting and stalking things. Imagine being this hybrid of a druid and rogue. Your party are tasked to find something in the forest and you just smell the air and said, Follow me, before turning into a beast and run ahead. How cool is that? <laughs> well, 
Don't actually run ahead and leave the party behind. Please spare the DM. <laughs> okay, so for the third level spells, I have two different ideas. One is to conjure your own pack of whatever your animal is and hopefully not a penguin. And to be able to ambush someone that can use a detection magic on you, maybe some definition spells, and double down on the stalking part. Again, a split between a druid and a rogue. First level slot is where I'm I'm stuck and I, I, I just can't pick a pair of spells that have the most connection to them. So there's polymorph. With a warlock you can already use Eldritch Invocation to do this, but this is an actual spell and free up your Eldritch Invocation slot. And Dominate Beast will you know the team by now, I assume. Okay, fifth level spells. Awaken is a fun spell. Fight me. Imagine an army of squirrels. An actual squirrels, not a summon squirrels, a squirrels. A bunch, no, an army of squirrels. As for chaos, it seems to be a weird spell choice, isn't it? But remember, we're warlocks and we should be able to make contracts and shits. So that's my reasoning here. Call of the Wild. Starting at first level, you gain the ability to shape shift into a weird creature of your choice for an hour as a bonus action. Until you turn back into your human form, you gain these following benefits. Your walking speed is increased by 10 feet. You're, you gain dark vision with a range of 120 feet. Your unarmed attack deals 2d4 slicing damage on a hit. And if you have pack of the blade feature, your unarmed attack counts as your pack weapon. You use charisma modifier for the attack and damage modifier. While you are not wearing any armor, your armor class are equals to 10 plus your dexterity modifier plus your charisma modifier. To gain this benefit, you can use a shield. You can use this feature a number of times equals to your charisma modifier. And you regain all expanded use when you finish a long rest. Right, that's a lengthy one. So, I cannot decide whether or not to put a duration on this one. So, because if I give it like 10 minutes per long rest or short rest, it will be pointless. I don't want it to just be a combat only feature. I want it to be a part of the character. So, so far, my best bet is an hour at a time and you can use it up to your charisma modifier per long rest. But that is up to the DM to decide. Please do remember that you still need to use your spell casting focus to cast your spell. So. If you want to be able to cast stuff while you're in your werebeast form, and then you need to take the improvised pack weapon Elders Invocation. Since that invocation lets you use your pack weapon as your spell casting focus and your claws counts as pack weapon. And yes, Warlock as a class is very front loaded as I said, so some of them can yeah, I still cannot get over how the Fathomless gain of a spiritual weapon at level 1, a better one at it. So, it's this one over here is pretty acceptable power wise. Also, you can take a dip in this class to give the bard a fighting role. You know, you can take one level of it and like a three level bard, you still gain these benefits. Which is, well, I must admit, if you multi class with this, with this thing, it's kind of overpowered, but that's not how. I designed it in mind. As you may notice, this transformation is combat focused and doesn't reflect the beastly nature of the wilderness and stuff, so fear not, I'll talk about it in the next feature. Starting at first level, you can cast Wild Cunning at will as a first level spell without expanding a spell slot or material component. <laughs> well, this is a very warlock thing to do, isn't it? Yep, you get a free level 1 spell that you can cast as a cantrip. Have fun! But yeah, 
Wild Cunning is a first level transportation US spell from Art of Spells UA if I if I remember correctly. That reads as follows. You call out to the spirits of nature to aid you, and when you cast this spell, use one of the following effects. If there are any tracks on the ground within range, you can uh, make wisdom survival check to follow these tracks with advantage for one hour or until you cast the spell again. So with this feature, it's basically you gain advantage with tracking forever. If there is edible forage within range, you know it and where to find it. So you're basically a ranger now. If there is clean drinking water within range, you know it and where to find it. Again, ranger. If there's, there is a suitable shelter for you and your companion within range, you know it and where to find it. Send the spirits to bring back wood for a fire and to set up a campsite in the area using your supplies. The spirits build the fire in a circle of stones, put up tent, unroll bed rolls, and put any rations and water for your consumption. This is tiny hot, but it's an actual camping. <laughs> and have the spirit instantly break down campsites, which undo the following things that you did. And yes, that will allow you to have fun with the roleplay part. And I think it's better to integrate the spells effect as the feature, but it's the theme of the warlock to say, you get this spell for free, now look it up. Beastly Hunger. Starting at level 6. As a bonus action, you can eat the heart of a creature you killed to regain all of your spell slots. You cannot use this feature again until you finish a long or short rest. Yep, completely disappointing 6 level feature as expected from a warlock. It's a win more feature. Like the Hexblade, their raids and stuff. Yeah, it's a win more feature. It will not change how you play the class. Think of it like a reward for a good roleplay since normal adventuring party will look at you funny if you start eating some hearts. So. Unless of course you're playing an evil campaign, but it will be an interesting plot nonetheless. Imagine you're in the middle of combat with no spell slots, but if you can eat one of their heart, you can cast a big spell to help your party. Yeah, that's why it's a bonus action. Starting at level 10, you gain resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks not made from silvered weapons while you're on your werebeast form. Hey, Finally, you got the fabled weapon resistance. On the earlier version, I want to give this feature a bit earlier, at 6th level, but after some playtesting, this is a bit too much. So, I have, I have to move it to the... 7th level class feature, and this thing will allow you to tank better and can really throw yourself into the mid grinder. As I said, this subclass is a warlock's take on the druid, like a vile mockery to the tree hugging bastards. Of course, we cannot forget how tanky the druid is and since you only have one HP bar, basically, the logical solution is to half the damage taken. Combined with some Elder's Invocation, this subclass can be a full-on tank. And here you go. Starting at 14th level, once per long rest while you transform using Call of the Wild feature, you can choose five, up to 5 creatures you, that you can see, you imbue them with your patron's blessing and they gain the following benefits. Their walking speed is increased by 10 feet. They gain dark vision with a range of 120 feet. Their weapon attack deals extra 2d4 force damage on hit, and they gain plus 3 AC. This benefits last until you transform back into your human form. Yes, this feature's name is a Sabaton reference. <laughs> Bite me. <laughs> Get it? Bite me. <laughs> <coughs> This last feature is pretty fun, isn't it? The patron extends their blessings to your back, 
which can lead to an interesting scenario if your paladin hates all other kind of power other than their gods, basically. <laughs> Especially your eldritch being that you call a god. Whether or not they transform with you is up for the DM to decide. And in order to give it some versatility, I will allow this the, this feature's flavor to be a little bit ambiguous. Do they transform with you? Do they only get the blessings, spiritual blessings? Well, it's up for your DM or you, I guess. The name of the game is Eldritch Invocations. I have two of them. I have two builds. Remember that your claw counts as pack weapon, so you can take the improved pack weapon and dressing blade for a full berserker build like this with plus 10 damage modifier if you have 20 charisma. And since you can use bonus action to make another unarm attack, then that's 30 guaranteed damage on top of the 64s. Some other Eldritch Invocation I can suggest for these builds are Relentless Hex, Eldritch Smite, and Tomb of Lovestus for the extra tankiness. Okay, talk about Relentless Hex. You can teleport to your opponent like an interdimensional beast, hunting for his prey without caring about the material plane at all. You can just teleport to them. And then Eldritch Smite. I don't have to explain this, do I? Big damage. Hit them, big damage. Hit them again, big damage. Tomb of Life is this, it's a fun one. And with this build's melee play style, you can be actually be a really good tank and and absorb a lot of hits. You froze your body like a Wendigo, so that's a flavor right there. You can make a Wendigo build using the subclass. The second build is the Arcane Beast, a lumbering beast holding an arcane focus. Dashing around the battlefield, casting all manners of spells at you from behind the shadows. Also, you can eat their heart to restore your spell slot, so that's, that's a plus. For this one, I suggest the Eldritch Blast Invocations package, like uh, Agonizing Blast and Lungs of Liturgy and that all kind of stuff. And your speed will make it even harder for them to track you down and catch up with you. Some suggested Eldritch Invocation is Rippling Blast for more battlefield control. Another one that I like is one with shadows, like the beast, the beast jumps from shadow to shadow while casting their spells from afar. That kind of thing can be cool. But, 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 my favorite Eldritch Invocation for this build is Maddening Hex. There's so many ways to flavor it, it's unreal. Imagine an Eldritch Bee so unfathomable, their mere presence deals 5 damage at you every 5 or 6 seconds. They will wear upon your mind. Or is it? Mines. <laughs> yeah, this is a fun one. I love this for the flavor. Well, that's it. Cheers to Hugin who reject the rolling text for this thing. And it's not easy, I tell you. <laughs> I guess my love for body horror is really reflected in this homebrew as well. And talking about that, history and body horror are a perfect match, isn't it? That's why Bloodborne is so good. It it blends body horror and history so well that I cannot stress how much I love it. Okay, what else, what else, what else? Oh, yeah, I'm using a lot of images from Magic the Gathering because hopefully Wizard of the Coast doesn't mind that I'm using images from one product to benefit their other product. Also because all copyright belongs to them, so it makes things easier for us to create it, you know. Alright, uh, that's that, I think. Good night!